Welcome to The Contrarians, and tonight we're looking at Billy Squire, Dark Horse Artist. This was a Patreon suggested topic, and if you like what we're doing on this channel, you too could be a part of these discussions. We have a Patreon link below, we have a Ko-fi link, and you could uh, go there too and make a uh, donation to the channel if you like the content. Also, we have a T Public link. So if you want like a t-shirt, I didn't wear mine tonight, but I see John the Music Nut. Show us, John. Go ahead. Do it again. There he is. If you like what John's wearing, we have a T Public link below too, and you can support the channel that way. But like I said, I want to welcome our panel, Nick Esquire, Bill Schuster, John the Music Nut, and Tim Durling. And tonight we are looking at Billy Squire. So for those who don't know Billy Squire, Billy was an American rock musician, but he did, I would say, Billy, what would you say? More of arena rock, power pop. He kind of bridged that gap between both of those things, but he had tons of hits. Best known songs include The Stroke, Lonely is the Night, My Kind of Lover, in the Dark, Rock Me Tonight, Everybody Wants You, Emotions in Motion, and it goes on and on. So Billy Squire all started out in the band Piper. They put out two records, Piper and Can't Wait. The band was praised by critics. Circus Magazine touted it as the greatest debut album ever produced by a U.S. rock band. But uh, even though they got great reviews, their records didn't sell, and uh, they broke up. Squire signed with Capitol Records in 1979 and released his first solo album, The Tale of the Tape, in 1980. But there was an album that came out. Let's pull it out over here. Signs of Life. And there's a video that was made where, well, he's wearing a pink shirt and he's frolicking around on the floor. And people tend to think that that video tainted his whole career. I have a theory that it may possibly, maybe it wasn't that. Don't forget, his records after Don't Say No, they kind of sold less, even though I think Signs of Life did go platinum. Um, there is a quote that I found that's interesting. Martha Quinn, who was an MTV VJ, she said when Rock Me Tonight, which is the video in question, was released, she commented, I don't remember that video being poorly received at the time. So are we looking back? thinking of that maybe that's what trashed his career maybe his records just weren't selling maybe his records weren't as good as they were before i don't know maybe it was a shift in music style maybe it was other factors i don't know at that time he also stopped selling out shows so i don't know what it is but i thought we'd go around with the panel and i'm just going to go clockwise i'm going to start out with bill schuster John the Music Nut, Tim Derling, and Nick Esquire, and we're just going to go clockwise around, and I'm going to throw it out to Bill. Bill, do you think Billy's a dark horse artist? Um, I absolutely do. This was actually my topic suggestion. Well, then, hot dog. Well, so, yeah, he. Uh, I feel like Billy kind of gets uh, maligned uh, based on largely that video, but as you said, uh, at the time, I don't remember it being uh and I don't either. It was just another video. Think about yeah, everything that was so outrageous during that era. Hell, look at all the hair metal acts. Yeah. Look at poison for Christ's sakes. So was Billy that far out? I don't know. For some reason he's getting some uh, hate and I don't know why. But anyway, go ahead. So he actually uh has a little bit of a queen connection that uh with uh you know, Brian May, Freddie Mercury, and Roger Taylor have all made cameos. And, of course, Mac produced a couple of his biggest albums. But uh, 1984, the same year, Rock Me Tonight, and that video came out. There's also the famous uh, I Want to Break Free video by Queen, which mm -hmm. is often credited, I think, incorrectly with killing their career in the States. Yeah, I, don't, I think their career is already killed, if you want my personal opinion. I but... think both of these are examples of... Uh, revisionist history mm -hmm. that's been built up over time but i got a quick example uh this is a uh, rat and roll 81 to 91 in the liner notes here there's a quick comment when they were touring with billy squire as his opening act and uh, it was uh stated that uh 
it had to happen. Reports of the music industry giants such as Kerrang and Sounds being that Billy Boy couldn't stand the heat from these five Cal Cool Wildcats who were simply tearing up the stage. So it kind of tells me in the early 90s that uh, idea that Billy Squire was somebody who was worthy of disrespect had already been building the fact that he was singled out in another band's liner notes for derision like that mm -hmm. kind of goes to the whole the whole idea that he was kind of a whipping boy and undeservedly so i think because uh the man was immensely talented i'm sure he still is he hasn't put out an album since uh what the late 90s um but he clearly he was an excellent songwriter his pop hooks were all over the place i think he was sometimes pigeonholed as a hard rocker when he didn't necessarily fit in there there were definitely elements of that in his sound but a lot of people tend to try to put him in well with like rat really billy squire and rat were not necessarily a great match no um but to me, the idea of this episode is uh, I would just like to give the man a little bit of uh, credit mm -hmm. and try to uh, rebuild his reputation a little bit, maybe, because I think he has been much maligned. Um, even with the idea of this video, uh, he still had a number of uh, smaller hits, not so much on the pop charts after Signs of Life, but he did have uh, a number of rock radio hits. And that goes into the early 90s. So it's not like he had no success whatsoever. He didn't have don't say no level success, but how many people really sustained that level over that many years? Well, I think emotions in motion came close. Yeah, it was multi. But, uh, I can't remember. Double platinum, maybe. Uh, yeah, I think so. It's sold, sold really well. Yeah. And like I said, Signs of Life wasn't, you know, it didn't, I, I think it went platinum, it, but I don't know. And that cover is so 80s in a good way. Well, <laughs> well, yeah, maybe. But so you think that uh, you don't think that the video had anything to do with it. What do you think affected his career? What What was that moment where... Do you think it was just the changing in the music industry? Do you think it was, I don't know. What do you think, Bill? I think it's just a, uh, that natural evolution of an artist's career. I think that might've played a small role in it, mm -hmm. but uh, I think it's been much overblown though. You know, like every artist has ups and downs. Like I said, you cannot sustain that level over a period of years. He hit his peak and then there was a slow decline but he never really just fell off the face of the earth. Right. So, All right. Cool. Excellent. John, the music net, what's your thought on uh, Billy and his dark horse Ness? Well, this is why I think he's become a dark horse. Well, before okay. I get into that, I just want to give props to don't say no, which in my opinion was the second best album of 1981 next to moving pictures. I think that is a knockout of an album. Every song is great. Not every song got play on the radio, but it plays like a greatest hits album. And Emotions in Motion mm -hmm. from 82 is close. Mm -hmm. That's the sweet spot, so to speak. When, and then in 84 with Signs of Life, the big hit was Rock Me Tonight. And I can definitely tell you there was no bad criticism going out there about that video. I was an MTV junkie back then. That video was getting played all the time. People weren't criticizing that video. That song went to, excuse me, that was his highest hit in the United States, a hit number 15. And I, the albums from Signs of Life forward weren't nearly as strong, but they were still quite good. I think there were a few factors with him becoming a dark horse artist. As far as the 80s go, I think the record companies were putting more of their money and their attention into younger bands like Rat, like Motley Crue, 
like Def Leppard. Def Leppard opened for Billy Squire on the second leg of the Emotions in Motion tour when Def Leppard were pushing the high end. I'm sorry, it would have been Pyromania at that point. Um, so he was, so think about that. I'm, think about how huge Def Leppard became. That's how huge Billy Squire was then. You couldn't escape him for about three years on AOR radio. And as time went on, his songs were still getting played on AOR. You had Don't Say You Love Me. You had Love Is The Hero. You had Don't Let Me Go, Tied Up, Facts Of Life, She Goes Down. These were all really good songs. And I'm so, and I think that at that point was when the record company really wasn't giving them any love. Because when you're having two or three hits, um, rock radio hits on an album, I think and you're an established artist, those albums should at least be going gold. And they didn't. Mm -hmm. I think, I think they just, I think they just stopped giving them the push. Oh, I don't remember him getting any kind of promotion. You know? he, wasn't. he wasn't because they were, uh, they were probably thinking, and when he did here and now in 89, they were probably thinking, oh, he's 39 years old. We're not going to give him the push. We're, we're going to give it to these younger bands. And, and it's a shame because they were wonderful songs. I think Don't Say You Love Me should have been a smash, but it hit number 58 in the States. So I think that was one factor. But I think as time went on, he became the dark horse. And there's two reasons, in my opinion. Okay. One is the dumbing down of album-oriented rock. This is what I mean. In the 90s, you had this huge playlist of music you would hear so many songs from so many different artists you'd hear their new albums by these established artists you would also hear new songs by up-and-coming artists in the 90s and then around 2000 or so the record companies eventually they were in the united states most of them were only owned by five companies you didn't have too many uh, mom and pop radio stations in it. Mm -hmm. So, and when everything became like a monopoly, they shortened their playlists. So now you're not going to, just to give an example, you're not going to hear 20 songs by Rush anymore. You're going to hear five. You're not going to hear 20 songs by the Eagles anymore. You might hear six or seven. And who was hurt the most? It was hurt, the people, the artists that were hurt the most were artists like Billy Squire, who had about seven or eight songs in the early 90s that were getting played in regular rotation, four off of Don't Say No, alone. And now you hear one, you might hear Stroke, you might hear Everybody Wants You, Once in a Blue Moon, Maybe Lonely is the Night, Less often than that. Well, I'll tell you, John, the music nut here on <laughs> QFM 96 on classic rock radio, they play Billy Squire all the time. Not here. See, it must be a regional thing because he's never went away here. Well, they don't play anything off of Signs of Life. I can guarantee you that. But anything off of, you know, Emotions in Motion and Don't Say No, they must play him, I don't know, how many times a day. It's amazing. The thing, and John, we grew up with the same radio, rock, classic rock radio station. They played him all the time. Mm -hmm. And this time of year, his Christmas song is in heavy rotation. So I was just going to get into that. If they, if they stop playing it, shame on them, because they, that's how I learned about Billy Squires from classic rock radio. Yeah, me too. Yeah. Me also. And uh, I have one other. Well, Nick actually said something I was about to say. It is criminal that Christmas is the time to say, I love you. You never hear it anymore. And is one of the best modern Christmas <laughs> songs out there. Yeah, I agree. One of the best. Instead, you hear pop artists singing the classics instead of hearing this wonderful, great rocking Christmas song. You, you're lucky. If you might hear, you hear it once you're lucky during the Christmas season anymore. I remember it got played to death around this time of year for years. 
Um, and the, the final thing I'd like to say about how he became a Dark Horse artist is that he stopped touring. He, you have these bands out there doing these package tours, Journey and Sticks with special guest Don Felder, Ario Speedwagon and Night Ranger with special guest Loverboy. You don't, you don't see him out there touring. He did a little bit of touring, but not much. He never got on one of those package deals in the summer. And that kept them in the limelight. It, it, it kept them visible. Mm -hmm. Where you don't, now with him, he wasn't out there touring. We were like, we we're more like, what happened to Billy Squire? Well, he's, he's made good money. I'm sure he's still making good money from those songs that were sampled. And, you know, he had that right. Mm -hmm. But I think in, it did hurt him in the fact that a newer generation didn't hear his music. They heard Queen. They, they hear Journey. They don't hear Billy Squire. They might hear something because it was on Guitar Hero. That's it. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. So that's, I feel, why he became a dark horse artist. And I think it's a shame. What do you think part of it might have been because he got was so overplayed back in the 80s? You think that had anything to do with it? Was it oversaturation? Well, I'm just throwing it out there because I don't, that never really happened in this area in central Ohio. He was the, it wasn't oversaturation. He got played regularly, but it wasn't to the point where like, oh God, if I hear one more Billy Squire song, I'm going to puke. It was mm -hmm. never like that. He got played a lot, but he got, he got played as much as Journey. He got played as much as Four. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. He got, you know, he, got play as much as sticks and night ranger and bands like that but it wasn't an oversaturation so you think it was more the changing of the radio industry yes i think i think a lot of it had to do with changing the radio industry mm -hmm. absolutely I'm a, a lot of it and then the fact that he wasn't out there touring i mean that he could have a lot to do with it when was the last time billy went out i think the last tour he did like like a big tour was 10 years ago mm. And I know I read that he was actually part of Ringo Starr's All Star Band for a little bit too. But that's oh a, yeah, that's, that's right. He did cast. do that. Mm -hmm. That was in the nineties. But yeah. that's like a rotating cast, right? You know, I mean, but you never saw him out there on those summer package tours where people are, you know, reliving their childhood and all that. You, yeah, you I heard. Saw that. I just understood that he was retired. He just, you know, he's done. And he didn't make any albums either. That that's definitely another part of it because a lot of those bands that I mentioned they'll put out an album every five years or so, mm -hmm. and he stopped doing that too. I mean that that I think is really small because you know people are going out to see right. those bands these days. They they want to hear the songs from their youth. They don't want to hear something new most of the time anyway. All right. So all right. Thanks, John. I appreciate it. Let's Thank pop you, it over to Tim Durling. What's your take on the whole Billy Squire situation? Well, you guys all got to get out of my head because <laughs> everything I had to say, uh, you guys put it so wonderfully. Um, I couldn't agree more. I do want to add that there is something unusual about Signs of Life being such a rare, like out of print CD. And yeah, I don't know if it's ever been remastered by Rock Candy. They usually. I think it came out on BMG but it, or BGO, it totally, BMG. Yeah, BGO is a small UK reissue yeah. label. This is not, and I and and I love this band. It's just not Y and T. This is yeah. not Coney Hatch. This album sold a million copies. Yes. Why is it so rare? I so, know. you know, the, yeah, it's not just one thing. It's never just one thing. None of these things happen in a vacuum. Um, and as far as the video for Rock Me Tonight, I was, a, I, I was starting to watch videos around that time. I don't remember the video. I remember the song. I didn't see the video for several years later. I heard about it long before I actually saw it because people got to remember before YouTube, you couldn't just look for a video. Um, but uh, the first video I ever saw from him was on Much Music and it was Love is the Hero, which is a fantastic song. Great song. Did not hit the top 40. Should have. Um, and don't say you love me. I remember that one. Great song. Should have hit the top 40. Didn't. Um, don't let me go. Fantastic ballad. In 1989, there's no reason that shouldn't have been a huge crossover hit because that was the year of the power ballad. And that's what that was. It was a really, really great power ballad. 
And um, and he had a song on on um, Creatures of Habit that I thought was a great ballad too. The L O V E four letter word. Oh man, that is a that's a killer killer ballad. Anyway, um, it could have been the Rock Me Tonight video. Maybe people. I don't know. There's a little bit of closed mindedness. Same thing with the I Want to Break Free video. Um, it could have been partly because of that. I think, I do think, and this was mentioned, he had the misfortune of having Def Leppard open for him and then Rat open for him. He was being overtaken. And <sighs> Billy Squire should have been touring with someone like the Cars mm -hmm. or someone, you know, not a hard rock bordering on metal band. You know, it's kind of like, um, Bon Jovi opening for 38 Special when Slippery When Wet first came out and the poor 38 Special, they're just... And that, that kind of brings me to my next point. For most artists you talk about, there are peaks and valleys in their career. And sometimes it just isn't their time anymore. It's time to kind of fade away into the background and then another cycle goes by and people will remember those great songs that you had and all of a sudden, people start talking like as if you had this big career all along. It happens with just about every classic rock artist. Um, and I think that's what happened with Billy Squire. But the difference is it happened so fast. Mm -hmm. I mean, Don't Say No is what? Triple platinum. I think it was just very, I think triple platinum, double platinum, and then just single platinum. Millions and millions of albums. I mean, by the middle of the 80s, he was one of the biggest solo rock stars in America. Um, and then Enough is Enough comes out, which I don't think is a great album, but it had a great lead single. Um, yeah. And it didn't even go gold. So that's a huge drop. And he never even came close to that again. I think one of the, and, and I think maybe the main reason he's a dark horse artist is because he's not out there doing those 80s cruises, which he has every right to do what he wants. But there's an audience out there that would be like, hey, you know, I've seen Loverboy's 16 zillion times i've seen night ranger 16 zillion times but they got billy squire with them yeah that might make the difference in selling some tickets I mean, he could easily do that guy's a fantastic singer i mean he's just one of those naturally he opens his mouth and it sounds great mm -hmm. he wrote his own material he played guitar he, he was a multi-instrumentalist um he understood production Sometimes some, not all of his productions have aged all that well, but I like, I happen to like that Mac production sound that, you know, the, the, with the weird sounding drums. I, I, I really think that's a, a cool sound and it stands out. And that's why he's been sampled so many times, which is probably another one of the reasons why he can, because he owns his publishing. And every time I bet since we started this discussion, someone else, some other rapper has sampled either the big beat or the stroke because they're these nice big open beats that you can loop. And they sound cool. Yeah. And you can put something on top of it. I got this two disc compilation here called Reach for the Sky. And it is just great song after great song after great song. And the fact that he only scored four top 40 singles is kind of a surprise to me because I would have thought it would have been like a dozen. But and none of them cracked the top 10. Although I do have to say this, I'm pretty sure the stroke hit number seven in Canada. So that's that's pretty cool mm -hmm. and a pretty risque song to get on the radio in 1981 i might add i i i'm really kind of surprised that it did as well as it did don't say no is a killer album i agree it's it's pretty hard to argue with it um so yeah i think part of it is you know maybe the video maybe um because I, I remember seeing it years later and i go uh what was the idea behind this? Like, I don't know what was meant to be accomplished by this because that's, you watch that one. And then you watch those early ones from the don't say no album where it's just him and his band on stage. Those are timeless to me. Yeah. That's what it should have been. Yeah. Those are just soundstage rock me tonight's a great song, you know? Yeah. Um, and so there's that there's the, you know, they're just the natural falling out of favor. Fact is, is that he was probably considered to be old. You know, even though he, he was only in his mid thirties at this point, which is crazy, but there is that ageism and yeah, it's where the record company wants to spend their money. Um, how do you pull support for a million selling album and only do one run of CDs so that people that want the CD pay like a hundred bucks or more for it. That's what boggles my mind. Um, I did have another point, but do you think I could talk it back into my head? Um, you know, he, his music is 
worthy of going back and looking at because i'm looking at songs that you know barely made the charts if at all like you should be high love that's fantastic he was also an early collaborator with desmond child that wasn't a name that you heard all that much um and this goes way back to 1980 for that song um lonely is the night what a killer song i mean that's like the closest you're going to come to led zeppelin in 1981 um all night long first song on signs of life great song the production maybe is a little bit overdone um the first song on uh, here and now rock out punch somebody that's a great like that should have been somebody's warm-up song. There should have been some athlete that 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 walks out to that song. That would have been perfect for that. Um, I mean, I have no idea. It's it's I pretty I think it's pretty obvious that if he wanted to be out there doing something, he would be, unless he's in ill health. Um, but another like to 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 go to John's point as far as oversaturation. Now I remember what I was trying to say. Um, I think that even if people you know, younger people do hear the stroke or everybody wants you. They might know the songs, but they don't know who sings them. They can't, they can't match the artist to the song. So, you know, they're not going to, you're not likely to get them spot, but just Spotify plays if you don't know who sings the song and they're looking for a song called stroke me and they can't find, they, no, not that one. I don't know. I don't know what they song probably find stroke it. Uh -huh. Yeah. 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 And the other thing, um, and I got to be careful how I say this because I work in radio, but I totally agree with the mm -hmm. whole Titan playlist thing. And also there's no such thing as regional hits anymore. Mm -mm. Um, you know, it's fascinating to me that you had artists that could sustain careers for quite a few years without really ever having a gold album, but because there were pockets in the States where they were really popular. And I'm thinking of uh, people like Donny Iris mm -hmm. or um, shooting star, you know, y and t you know under the radar artists billy squire was not one of those billy squire was a major major million selling artist for like yeah for about a good three four years and um his music has stood the test of the time um he never jumped on any bandwagons he always did what he wanted to do and um you know it's and and maybe Maybe it's easier if you have a band, if you have a, a you know a brand to to not hide behind but stand behind. Maybe it's easier to last longer than if you're a solo artist. Um, you know, I don't know. Uh, it, it is a mystery, and and I think the reason it's a mystery is because you go back and listen to his stuff, and it's good, and you're like, why why isn't he out on those big package tours, or why aren't his albums getting legitimate reissues? from the actual label that put them out in the first place. And, and John raised another good point about the, the music labels. I mean, if you think about universal MCA, Mercury, uh, Island, Geffen, a and uh, these were all separate labels. Now they're all swallowed up by the conglomerate. I think even capital is owned by universal now because yeah. now capital artists have those crappy icon CDs in Walmart now. I think he's one of the artists I may have seen an icon CD by, but um, yeah, it's a shame, but hopefully people are watching this and if, they, if Billy Squire, I keep hearing that name and they check out some of his music and they, you know, download it or buy a couple CDs or something, you know, that's, uh, that's the best you can hope for because it's worth rediscovering. Yeah. Totally. Agree. I don't know if I've added anything unique because there's been so many points, so many great points brought up, but I just got to, I'm going to echo what everybody said. Yeah. It's if you've never heard his stuff or you've only heard a couple of songs, dig a little deeper. Yeah. He does need uh, more props. I will agree with that. Nick Esquire. What, well, what do you think? What can you add to this discussion, sir? I think I'm going to add a couple things that may be a twist on some things that were said, but okay. let me just, brag on him for a little bit um he's had nine releases and even though i consider myself a fan i only own two i got them in the used bins 397 mm -hmm. and i got emotions emotion for a buck in mint condition um, back in the the old days that was a dollar record all day all right. those billy squire albums were dollar records i had a chance to see him in 89 i'll talk about that in a second but uh um you know there's worse things in life than having in my opinion two albums that are essential and from classic hard rock and rock 
two of them that are pushing tens, nines or nines, nine or ten, uh, and that don't say no and uh, emotions emotion. Mm -hmm. When I came of age with music, emotions emotion was everywhere. Songs played on that album on classic rock radio beyond just the singles. So I knew half of that album before I even acquired it. They were played all the time. And of course, then you had the overlap from the songs from Don't Say No. So from, from that period, which they always talk about from like 81, 84, you just had Billy Squire everywhere. And he was a big name. Um, you know, didn't mention it, but boy, he had some great musicians with him too. And, you know, they talk about the samples as his drums. And Tim, you correct me because it's a French sounding name, but Bobby, I, I would say Chouinard. Chou I think it's Chouinard. Chouinard, okay. And he I only is, say that because the, there was a figure skater named Jose Schwinard, and her name spelled the same. I'm not really sure. Yeah, Bobby Bobby died quite young too. In 1997, and not that he was the secret to Billy's success, but you know he was a big part of his sound. And man, he had a steady can, band, and that counts for a lot. Hit. He can hit like an MF, or he was a great drummer. Yeah. Uh, I didn't realize that his bass player for many years, off and on, was a guy by the name of Mark Clark. Mark Clark has a wonderful resume. I know him more recently as a guy who's been playing with Clem Clemson and John Heisman from Coliseum and, and mm. Clem from Humble Pie. Uh, but he sang for, he, he played uh, in a hot minute for uh, 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 Uriah Heep. I didn't know he was on The Wizard and uh, uh, sang for Mountain. But anyway, so he had all these great guys in him. 1980, Tale of Tape. Who's his guitar player? Bruce Kulick. Ridiculous. It's yeah. ridiculous. Yeah. So it's, he's had these great bands. And when I grew up, I had him, he was considered a hard rock guy. I'm going to get to what I, what I think one of the problems with him was. He was marketed to women. You had Don't Say No. We know now who the foot model is from the first April Wine album. <laughs> Crap, I was wondering who it was. Yeah, this here he answers is. a lot of questions. And, and and a bit of an artiste himself, I said that in quotes. Yeah. You know, we went Andy Warhol. Andy I mean, Warhol, really? yeah, yeah. So he was marketed for the ladies. And and I think the core of his... his uh, his fans were guys because he was a hard rock guy. When mm -hmm. I saw him in 89, he had the balls, the balls to take out King's X on the road with him. And King's X was on the Gretchen Goes to the Nebraska album. Of course, the, the crowd was just like looking at like stunned amazement at the Kirby Center, John. But yeah. uh, he was great. But the show illustrates a couple things, even with Billy the Artiste, that I think was a marketing problem. His big thing in the middle of the show, he's playing music. It's all hard rock, heavy, uh, hard rock and stuff. He has a backdrop that he unfurls, comes down, and it's the cover of the Here and Now album, which was only appealing to the ladies in the crowd. Like, that was the big moment of the show. And for me as a, you know, a, a teenager, you know, hetero guy, it just fell flat. It, it didn't make any sense. And then he did a couple other things. Like, he kept name dropping all the people who kissed his ass, like Axl Rose. And I was like, well, what's he doing? So he, there's a little bit of, and if you look at some of the things that happened afterwards, I, I don't think he was marketed properly. Tim, you probably noticed he never had hits in the UK, never had hits in Europe, never had hits in Japan. It was the US, Canada, and Australia. That is so very, like, that is really interesting, especially the UK thing, because I used to think he was from the UK. Of course. I and didn't someone, think, I, I didn't know he was from Boston. Someone dropped the ball. Like, if you ask the kid now, they don't know Billy Squire from Billy Thorpe. So, yeah. you know, it, it, Billy Schmilly. So there's there was some dropping of the ball. I think at some point, 91 and on, well, grunge and Billy Squire was written off. I I, that, I I chalk a lot of that up to that. But some of this was also caused, in my opinion, by the artiste himself. I My recollection is that he blamed the video. He was out there saying the video. He kept kicking himself in the ass. Why would you keep blaming that video? Because so he was out there all was my the career. model in your video, Billy. Oh, yeah, it was you. I mean, the video was directed by Kenny Ortega, one of the biggest directors in the world, right? So it's but not he, like he, he didn't have a lot of money behind it. He was laying it at the feet. Now, I and then this is my fault, but I did not hear all these albums all the way through. So one of the great things about the contrarians is I got to hear these really quickly <laughs> and I enjoyed them. But <laughs> Signs of Life is so over the top 80s with that cover. Jim Steinman's the producer, but it's not a bad album, but it is very, his sound started to become a bit wimpy. Bobby, I'd, rather hear, keyboards. Mac, I'd rather hear the Mac production on the Signs of Life Thank album. You. I saw, and I love, Enough is Enough. It's one they, of the things I learned about the Contrarians. I didn't really understand what's this Mac stuff. I love that production. Yeah. I feel when I listen to Emotions Emotion 
and uh, don't say no. I feel like I'm in a rehearsal studio at SIR waiting for the band. They're, 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 they're getting ready to go on tour. I love that, that sound of, I feel like I'm in the room with them. And that's that sound. And Billy fired Mac because he had a disagreement with the production or something. Right. right. So, so here's my, here's my observation though. You know, you had uh, uh, Rock Me Tonight and, and the, the rest of the album is starting to get a little bit more with the, the, the 80s gadgetry, but- Much more next, commercial. But the next album came out and I think that was even worse. Oh, yeah. that's it's Peter cool. Collins producing and it sounds terrible. It's it is very 80s. There's that could have been a there, lot to do with it. Yeah. There's a song in there called Another 1984. And I started counting all the crazy 80 gadget, 80s gadgetry on there. And it was starting to become silly. And that so should be Brian May that, that should have been a drop dead classic. That's Brian May playing the solo on that. But it's, but it's distracting. It's underneath no all that, like, it's the, distracting. the one that I always laugh at is all night long. Great yeah. song. Yeah. It's got this, and then you hear this like there's this really fast like yeah. cowbell effect. It's like, why yeah. did you need to throw that in there? There's it's just it's too much of everything. And Jim Steinman. Joe Elliott said this on on uh, the documentary about hysteria because they were trying to get Jim Steinman to produce the follow up to Pyromania when Mutt Lang became unavailable, and he said Jim Steinman is a songwriter. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like Todd why didn't Rundgren they get Todd Rundgren for Christ's sake? Right, Todd Rundgren right. produced Bad Out of Hell. Jim Steinman right. wrote it. He's not a producer. Right. It's overproduced to the right. death. And for Peter Collins, he's a better producer than I hope that nobody hears that album and thinks that's right. what Peter Collins' production sounds. No, but, no, 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 no. But it's an Operation Mind Crime. That's a good Peter Collins right. production. But think about it. We're now we're now 84 through 86 with all the things in the marketplace. And he comes out with what I'll describe as two, although I do like the single from Enough is Enough. Uh Love is a Hero is a good single, but mm -hmm. it was it was almost like a wimpy Billy Squire with the stroke and every and uh, everybody wants you and all these heavy songs. It was kind of getting wimpy. And I think he lost again marketing to the ladies. He lost a lot of fans. I think, I think if he might have, if he put out here and now with like, don't say you love me as lead single in 86. Right. Mm -hmm. Maybe yes. he might've stayed the course and, and, and become yes. someone like more like a, Oh, I don't know. I'll just throw a name out there. Like Eddie money who sure. managed, who very quietly sure. just kept having gold albums. until yeah. he, sure. he kind of in, reinvented himself, you know, yeah. you're right about that. And Hey, when all else fails, when you're desperate, Bo Diddley beat, which is, uh, which is that on that single. Da, da, and, da, and that's one of the reasons I went to see him. I so enjoyed that song. I said, Oh, Billy Squire's a town and King's X. Well, this is ridiculous. You gotta mm -hmm. go. And I think it was sold out, but so, and, and then afterwards, you know, he had these here and now got no support. And what tell the truth or whatever was the afterwards preachers the of truth. habit and then yeah, tell the truth right. and both of those were i've i'd never they seen those new in stores i would only see them marked down or used they're ignored they, and, and he was, back a, to him he too, was a tax a, at this point he was a write-off for the record label that's yeah. right that, that, right they had to, they had to satisfy the contract mm -hmm. yeah the, the thing with him too again he's a bit enigmatic like you know the 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 the, the big uh, uh tapestry comes down with his face but then he wears like, I don't know, like a gym shirt, you know, like he's always dressed down. So he did, he avoided like getting tarted up with the hair and spandex. So he's a, he's really enigmatic to me. Like uh, I remember in interviews too, he could come across as surly. So I don't know if he did himself any favors in the music press. I don't know for sure, but I just remember hearing him going like, is he cranky? So, I read it. He might've burned some bridges. Yeah. You know? I read an interview with a guy and, and some of you will recognize this name and the name is Jack Ponty. Um, yeah, he um, he was an early collaborator with John Bon Jovi back in the early 80s in the Power Station studios. And of course, Billy, I think, recorded Tale of the Tape there at Power Station. So um, and I don't know if I read an interview with Jack Ponte and he's got nothing good to say about Billy Squire. Wow. Like, and I think he I think I think the, the last part of that segment of the interview was like, stroke this asshole. Wow. So, um, yeah, I, I think maybe he might have been, you know, I've heard people say that the bigger the star, the smaller the ego. But when they're like at that mid-level, they think they've invented music. Well, here's a perfect example of a guy who was at that. <coughs> mid -level. But, you know, there are those moments when you do see something that you at least hope is a humbling experience, because you can spot Billy uh, on yeah. the Freddie Mercury concert for life oh, okay. during the big finale when Liza Manley singing, we're the champions and everybody comes up on stage. He's somewhere in there, but he didn't yep. even perform that night. Right. A band that opened for him performed earlier, but he didn't. 
you know, and I'm and, sure and, he was there because he's friends with all those guys, right? Like Brian May and all those guys. And, and here's the thing, and, and maybe I'm being too harsh, but the guy walked away from them, which is a tough thing to do. So he basically walks away from recording music. He basically goes into semi-retirement. So there was a certain, there's a certain humble aspect to this guy, which is impressive. And maybe it's just he realized it was time for him to get off the stage. I mean, that's a that's a pretty that's a pretty um, uh, difficult thing to kind of realize as a, as a star. And by the way, he didn't need the money. <laughs> that's exactly that. I think he, has everything to do with it because yes, you know, even if he thought maybe he might get a band together and do a tour, maybe he started doing rehearsals and said, you know, something, I can't sing like I used to. But if he needed money, we all know that doesn't stop people. <laughs> no. Right, right. And, and, if, and if he doesn't need to go slogging it through the Midwest on a, on a co-headline bill, I was trying to figure out with a friend of mine. A friend of mine is a very mature a music fan, Dylan, you know, Beatles, uh, mm -hmm. uh, old 97s, Wilco, trying to educate me. And I mentioned this. I'm going to be on Willie Squire waiting for him to say something snarky. I love Billy Squire. He absolutely loves the guy. Really? But we, I yeah, loves him. that. Yeah, but he, he, he was because he was a populist a, kind of artist. But yep, we were trying to figure out a good co-headlining bill with him. But if he doesn't need it, like, does he need to go slogging through the Midwest with Hart or Pat Benatar or uh, I thought Bad Company or Paul Rogers would be great for him? Yeah, he doesn't need it. He doesn't need it. But, but great to see him back out, though. I'm just saying. Right. But to you his know, credit, musically, you know, musically, he would have fit right in there in that time period when Bad Company had Brian Howe in the turn sure. of the 90s like there's no reason why he couldn't have had hits and bad company came back from nowhere we're having hits all of a sudden sure right mm -hmm. as a matter of fact because what we've been talking about it i mean for my quick listen to these albums those albums are are fine like i was i i gave them quick grades most of them are like sevens uh i like the acoustic i didn't go back to it yet but i liked it i thought it was an interesting thing um i, I gave my lowest grade to enough's enough i thought that was a five um but but you know he's got two nines the th my my biggest thing that I come away with, by the way, after all of this and talking about a dark horse, I've never listened to Tale of the Tape all the way through. Uh, and you, that album is very, very good. It's an eight at least. It's yeah. as by the good way, as the first, the the second and third ones. I by the way, look at that cover though, as far as like a marketing problem. You've got Billy with this come hither look and the red uh, blouse. You know, yeah, then, that could be a you know 1980. That could have been a disco album or an Andy right. Give album. And, and then, it looks and like after, an album cover that could have been on Casablanca for Christ. Right, exactly. After, well, he, the Bill O'Coin. There was a connection there, right? That's right. Now, don't yeah. say no. At least looks like a rock album. Yeah, except for the right. pose. But the, the pose. Yeah, but, but at least he's got a guitar. Like it, right. You know, emotions in motion. What is that? But if anyone, if anyone is like, don't say no, and emotions in motion, tail the tape is really good. Yeah, really good it album. is. It sounds great. I think yeah. it's great. Yeah, highly really, recommend it. If that you can was find it by um, who produced that one? Eddie, Eddie Offord produced yeah. that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Matter of fact, two bands that came through. Not that he was copying, but it reminded me of his Cheap Trick and Foreigner album. If you listen to some of those songs. It's, it's good. Yeah. Anyway, I like Billy. I think he's good. I, I like this exercise. I'm gonna go back and listen to more Billy Squire. And there's, you know, uh, you know, having two albums that are nines or tens is not uh, not a bad career. Yeah. And he should get out there and play in some capacity. He should at least do one of those 80s cruises, right? Not a full tour. Yeah, why not? Just go out there and get all the pampering. I got an idea, because this is the 800-pound gorilla in the room. We didn't mention it. But they say that he spends most of his time gardening and, and working in a 20-acre section of, of uh, Central Park. Mm -hmm. He's been doing it for years, to his credit, and through a conservancy. I think we should take a road trip out there and sort of lie in wait with like binoculars. Rakes, keep, keep an eye on him. Rakes and shovels. And, and, you know, we'll see him coming down with the wheelbarrow, you know, with flowers or something and approach him. Hey, Billy, you got to get out there or at least help him for an afternoon. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I could come and bring some bags of mulch. And <laughs> what a, yeah. That's yeah. mulch. Right. The whole thing, raking leaves, the whole thing. But to his credit, you know, that that's a pretty interesting that he devotes so much time to that now that you know i think he stands Absolutely. alone i can't think of any other rock stars that en that ended up gardening <laughs> right so there's a certain that's why i'm saying he's enigmatic there's a certain yeah. humbleness to this guy it's really impressive despite the andy warhol <laughs> album cover yeah i'm sure he went through a period where he was you know thought he was all that but he had everybody telling him he was all that right yeah. 
and that's what happens. Yeah. Um, after hearing everybody going around, I I think I can safely say I don't think it was the Rock Me Tonight video that killed his career. I think that was an easy target. Sounds like to me is either changes in the radio industry could be the production of his records might have had something to do with it. People wanted that rock and Billy Squire. They don't want keyboard drum machine, Billy that might've had something to do with it, or it could have just been, Hey, the guy was 35. Maybe they didn't want to pump money into him anymore. You know, I think, uh, but I don't think it was the video because like Martha Quinn said, she doesn't remember anything during that time period that it was nothing unusual for the time. You well, know? And not everybody had MTV. True. People have to remember that. Not every household in America had MTV during its first few years of existence. Right. And well, and then you've got, you know, don't say no went triple. And then you've go, got emotions, emotion that goes down too. He just kind of had a, he had his peak. That was his peak and he's just go, riding it down. That's just the way it happens, I guess. I but I don't think it was the video to uh, Nick's point about, yeah, Billy himself did blame the video. He blamed uh, Kenny Ortega, but Kenny Ortega turned it around and said, uh, he put it back in Billy's court and said that bill, that video was all Billy. And apparently Kenny tried to actually have his name removed from it. <laughs> what it's worth. Oh, ow. But, uh, and uh, also to Nick's point about marketing to the ladies, my introduction to Billy Squire was, uh, say, 81, 82. My mom and dad had just separated, and my mom's rebound guy made her a bunch of mixtapes. <laughs> he had great taste in all kinds of current and past music, and he had a bunch of songs from Don't Say No, which was current at that time. And for whatever it's worth, uh, my mom was in her mid-30s at that time, and she uh, bought Emotions in Motion when it came out, so... That was enough to get her going. Yeah, I never really saw Billy as a, a ladies' man, but maybe he was. I don't know. Yeah, I was just a you know kid. I didn't really pay attention. You know, I don't know. So we may never really know, but like I said, I don't think it was the video. I think there were a lot of things in play here. Hey, as far as I know, he could have burned his. He could have burned the bridges, the way he his attitude and stuff. But you know, how do we know? You know, if you if you if you piss off a bunch of people in the radio and in, in the industry, you know, mm -hmm. bite the hand that feeds. Mm -hmm. Maybe Show that's why sign. Maybe that's why Signs of Life is a is a million selling album that you can't find a CD very easily. To you know, he might have just burned a lot of bridges with his label, with his management. Um, you don't know. We don't know. We're just you know, guys. We're not claiming to know anything out here. If anybody's watching, think. What yeah, do they we're know? just we having a discussion. Anything. We're yeah. saying he's got great music, and why don't more people talk about him? Right. And if you see this CD, by all means, yeah, buy like, it. Yeah, that yeah. one. Enough is enough for Tales the Tape. I've never seen capital versions of like yeah. legit capital versions of those. And this looks just like those April Wine ones. So it's yeah, all from yeah. that same era. I just yeah, and the Sammy Hagar ones too. And which same are with rare. this. Yeah. Yeah. This is all that same era. Yeah. Wow. But anyway, yeah, we love Billy Squire. So if you see anything, you know, we're all fans in this chat. I think it's just terrible what happened to his career, but sometimes, sometimes things don't work out. Um, anybody else have anything to add or plug real quick? No. Listen to Billy Squire. Yep. Yeah. You see some Billy, pick it up. And you can find it out there. I mean, for the most part, it's cheap. In fact, yeah. when I got this, I only, well, this, I saw this in the bin, in the cheapy bin, and I almost lost an ovary because <laughs> I couldn't, I couldn't believe it. And it was yeah. like, I think it was $5.99. That's crazy. That is such a rare, that's that. that this one... is the only time I've ever seen it in my whole life yeah. in the wild. That, that CD and another one that came out the same year that was fairly successful is a, Peter Wolf lights out. That's almost that. impossible. Yeah, that's really? almost impossible to find. I should on CD. It. Yeah, I've got yeah. it. Really? I found it in the cheapy. No, <coughs> one cheapy, but it was in. It was five ninety nine. It was a cutout though. That's pretty cheap. Only time I'd ever saw it, and I thought, well, I might want to pick that up because wow. it used to go for big money back in the day, and the and this went for big money. But yeah. like I said, BGO re released. It's on a twofer. 
with, I think it's a twofer with enough is enough. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. So it's out there, but it's never been re-released. In the, well, yeah, it did. Big Beat on that label that's now defunct was a reissue label. But that's American what I'm saying. Beat might have been American. I think beat. it's American Beat, but I think that's what I'm saying. Why didn't EMI put it out again? It sold a million copies for them. I don't get it. It's weird. I don't understand it at all. Yeah. Well, there you are, kids. There's our Billy Squire Dark Horse uh, episode. Go out and find some Billy. We love Billy. Trying to give Billy some love. So anyway, please like, subscribe, Kofi, Patreon, join the chats if you want. Anyway, I want to thank my uh, panel tonight, Mick Esquire, Tim Durling, John the Music Nut, and Bill Schuster. And we'll, we'll see you on the next one. Good night. Good night, everybody.